The haka is all about timing and control, synchronizing our actions before we head into war, creating the energy, warming up, preparing the body physically, mentally, emotionally before the onslaught. Deriving power from our people, who we are, our ancestors, where we've been, where we've come from, where we're heading. Hey! Yeah! Three generations ago, my grandparents were forbidden to speak Māori at school. And now we have seen a revival of our culture and it's their sense of confidence, pride and belonging, what it is to be Māori. The Māori, the legendary people who came from Polynesia and were the first to set foot on these lands almost 1,000 years ago. They had to adapt to a powerful wilderness where ice rubs shoulder to shoulder with tropical climates. The Maori made them their gods and their ancestors. Their symbiotic relationship with their environment is part of their DNA. Nowadays, after decades of acculturation, the Maoris are trying to rediscover their own identity. Our people have been lost in the big white world. A new trend has now started with young people once more being proud of their origins. Looking at this struggle is like trying to understand their unique perception of the world amidst an enchanting scenery some describe as the traveler's ultimate dream. It all begins on the Northern Island in Whanganui this is the name of the river the local Maori identify with, a sacred river, 290 kilometers long, which became in 2017 the symbol of the Maori cultural recovery. This newly gained recognition means that this river is granted the same respect as a human being, a world first. Going back to its shores, has become a kind of pilgrimage for many Maoris, a way to go back to their origins. With this recognition or new legislation, it's important to understand as Maori, we have an affinity to our whenua, to our land, to our environment. And I was raised on this river um, right from when I was a child and exposed to the beauties that this river has and the tonga that our awa um, Wanganui Te Awatupua has to share with us all. Not, not just necessarily Māori and Wanganui to our river, but how we as Māori um, can, can connect with an environmental power like the river. To reconnect. This is the whole point of these boat trips that Ashley and his uncle George organise. An adventure that is first and foremost an excuse to tighten the bond and once more learn the Maori language at the heart of the river's history and legends. The Maori see human beings as inseparable from their environment. Wanganui is considered to be the common ancestor of all the tribes that live on and around the river. Te 
Aristi and her sister, Rero Maki, never came back to their childhood village. However, the new status of the Wanganui River awoke in them a need to go back to their origins. We grew up in Wellington, Lower Hutch, so very urbanised. So it's, it's a wonderful journey and connecting back to the Awa, to the people. Uh, yeah, just being home. Because even though we weren't brought up here, we are still here. You know, our grandmother um, grew up with her grandmother on the river. Um, but when my dad, her son, was born, they never grew up here. So, hence to say they never came back here. Yeah, so, yeah, it's going to be exciting. Really anxious. I've been feeling anxious about coming back. Yeah, just reconnecting with who we are and what we're about. Hmm. We're starting to see more people come, and in doing so, they're able to come and see the parts of their river, their, their marae, that they all connect to. It's a sign of that transitioning down to our younger one. The reunion with the Wanganui River is celebrated through a collective prayer. It helps bring together even more of those that define themselves as children of the river. This journey, which brings them to the last inhabited village, must strengthen this bond. All of us are here because somewhere in our big toe, if you're like me, we got Paka Papa to this place. So me to you as Gururi, coming back to this place. But I'll tell you, Paka Papa, of all things of this world, we're fragile, we're insignificant, and all of these other plants, leaves here, are the generations that have brought us through to today. You and I are killing Papa in a lot of little ways that we live. So I appeal to you when you come back to beautiful places like this, is let's all just try and walk on the earth a little more gently. So that others, others, if we, when we end up down here or down here, there'll still be others of us with our DNA up here that can come back to this beautiful place. Let us take that opportunity to gather. Join us. Let us live united. Getting back to nature, that's what I remember, and the people, and sharing time with you and Estelle and my sister, yeah, just meeting new people, lots to remember. The Wanganui River is a fundamental element of the Maori mythology. It also used to be a major transport highway until the colonists came. The region was one of the most populated, but the Waitangi Treaty in 1840 turned New Zealand into a British colony and little by little the Maoris were stripped of their lands. From 120,000 inhabitants when James Cook arrived in 1769, the population fell to 40,000 in 1900. 
Since then, the Wanganui tribes have continuously claimed their rights on the river. Inia is a historian and a member of the Atemoana tribe. He helped with the last negotiations that led to the recognition of the river. When it's accorded legal status, it highlights that our treaty partner, the Crown, has finally recognized what we've been intrinsically fighting for for the last 150 years and the price we've paid for that. And we know when our river is sick. The first obvious thing was the insatiable desire for, for land would bring uh, the European and the colonials upriver and it would impact on the river. And the first visual impact was when they started to dynamite and change the channels and the courses of the river to accommodate uh, the steamboats. The impact of agriculture and farming and in terms of runoff and, and the algae, the lack of water flow, which is much uh, the consequence of hydroelectricity schemes and the headwaters. And our values are now recognized by the LAW as provides us a sense of momentum and at least hope for the next generation. Back to the river, further downstream, where Ashley's expedition is reaching its main goal, the last inhabited village. We've arrived at Tieke Marae, this is a significant marae um, along the Whanganui River with significant history. Um, history that has really shaped um, what this marae has become today. It's a wonderful experience to be with family, hugely connected to the river, hugely connected to the people here and the land uh, surrounding the river. It's just been amazing. Yes. Very good. It um, uh, fills up your spirit, it fills up your heart. Mm. Yes, very good. So, big boy. Uncle George, there you are. Everything all right? Every Wanganui tribe sees TK village as the symbol of their resistance. But for a foreigner to be allowed entry, they must follow the custom and receive approval from the ancestors. This is the waharoa, or the entranceway. And the entranceway is the first point of engagement on any marae. Generally, the waharoa looks directly at the house. This space in here is the most sacred place on a marae. In traditional times, it was the last encounter in a warring battle. And so because of that, there are particular protocol. This process means to break down barriers or a means to unveil people's intentions. The ceremony begins with the tekaranga or welcome call. It is pronounced by the Kiritahi, the keeper of the Marai, and her voice represents the ancestors granting hospitality. I salute you, dear guests, who came back to our majestic river. I salute the people from this village who welcome us warmly into their homes. Us and others from New Zealand and from all over the world, thank you very much. Hosts and guests then mix their breath as a sign of unity. This kiss of the nose and brow is called hongi and honours all life forms in this world. <laughs> when we say ko te awa ko te awa ko o, we are saying I am the river and the river is me, and that runs through our blood, through our veins. 
The river was the highway. If you can imagine just closing your eyes and being able to see waka travelling up with kai, with families, um, going to the next marae, sharing and bartering, and you'd be able to see children laughing and running and jumping in and playing in the water, and you'd see parents, mothers and fathers, digging their gardens, living sustainably off the, off the land. Now that was what happened back in the old days. And what we want to do now is bring that back. Our people have been lost in the big, wide world. And it's so important for us to say to them, Uki mai ki te kainga, come back to your home, come back to our awa. Our river calls you. This meeting house here also belongs to a lot of the, the families that came back. So it's only right that they come and sleep in the, the belly of the ancestor. So a lot of them, this is the first time they've been here, but through their bloodlines, they've um, the ancestors are the same as this ancestor here. We make sure that before it gets dark, because there's no, no power here, that they're already settled into you know just some cosy warmth um, for the night, and then we'll do our um, we'll eat together. Eating together is beautiful because we all share food, we share stories in the night time and then in the morning uh, we uh, bid them farewell but the memory is forever. Nightfall on Wanganui. For a couple of hours the river is once more full of life as it used to be. This is our first time, um, and it probably won't be the last. I'd venture to say we would be back and bring our children back to show them this place. First, I'd like to thank the people of Tiki for their immense gratitude and hospitality. Thank you, Uncle George. Ungawai. Ashley. Thanks for having supported and accepted us. But what he was trying to say is this is not goodbye. When you return, come speedily back to your 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 land. Katia Nangati Kurupatia. Torea Tina Koto Tina Tata. Thanks to its newly gained recognition and status, Wanganui has become the symbol of a people who have long been despised and who are now slowly getting back in touch with its land, culture and dignity. For those who define themselves as children of the river, when the time comes to go, it's not easy to leave behind such nostalgic reunions.
Once back in Whanganui town, at the mouth of the river, Ashley will immortalize his latest pilgrimage with a new tattoo. <laughs> Yet another way to reconnect with old traditions and customs. Indeed, tattoos are undergoing a revival. Inia is one of the country's most famous tattoo artists, and he practices his craft according to tradition. And this is where we make all our tattoos and stuff. This is my um, teacher, Polo Sukawapi the um, second. He taught me the traditional hand tools, which I have now shown to Croc and Muko. This is some of his tools here. This tool here is for tattooing the face. No, this is um, the, the tooth of a wild boar. And that's for doing the power, doing this tattoo here. And um, this is um, using the traditional tool to tattoo the chin of the wahine, the woman. Um, that signifies the arms and legs of the baby coming out of the mouth of the woman. The signification of the tattoo on the face is um, back in the day, it was a man wasn't complete without his face tattooed. It was, it was the ambition of every man to have his face tattooed. Yeah. Um, what about putting another collie, just swinging your collie through there? That's kind of what I was thinking. <laughs> where, where, does it, where does it want to come from? Here? Like, can we pull it on the other side? I like this. Moko is one of Inia's disciples. This young tattoo artist wishes to find the origins of this art, as much through the patterns chosen as through the tools used. For him, making tattoos is almost like being an activist. We're using some moves which are from our tribes, uh, which reference the different tribes that we come from, as well as giving us physical and spiritual strength to go forward. This here is a traditional structure which our ancestors used to wear. My father was tattooed when he was younger, about 25 years ago. And so I've always been keen on the idea of getting a tattoo done. Um, I'm very proud of my heritage and my, my, my culture and all of that, and I'm willing to, sh to show that um, on my body. To the inhabitants of this kingdom, to the gods who created this environment, with death you shall find life. Keep this within you, forever etched in your flesh. Let us take this opportunity to gather. Let us be as one. Let us remain united. We do a prayer to bring us into a sacred zone, a time of changing someone's body forever and making them safe in that space. I have the potential to make someone's body beautiful, or I have the potential to make the person ugly, or even to make them very ill. So that's a large responsibility. I've always had a deep sadness that no one practiced it in this country in a way that our ancestors used to. And I've always thought that was a great loss of our culture. And so I always wanted to help revive that. Bringing this art form back is part of an overall cultural movement of reclaiming uh, and re-empowering our identity our cultural practices, which have been practiced in this land for hundreds of years. And the, the dream is that one day all our male parliamentarians had full facial moko. You know, then we're getting closer to the old days where all our leaders wore moko. Bye, bro. Well done. In 
a way, it's a really exciting time. It's a form of reclaiming and um, re-empowering our cultural practices, which have been challenged by foreigners coming in and challenged with a lot of force from the missionaries, um, which led to our people walking away from our own practices uh, as much as we used to value them. So now it's a chance for us to to break down, to question uh, our identity and to find what things we want to start to reclaim before they're completely lost, any trace of them is lost, um, and take pieces of the puzzle that are left and try to put them together as best as we can, and from there go forwards. Reclaiming is indeed happening in many different ways. In the Southern Islands, the Maori reclaimed a fundamental element, something considered a treasure of nature, punamu, or jade stone. The Maoris believe it has tremendous powers. Jeremy is passionate about this precious stone and makes jewelry out of it. His ancestors were colonists from the Netherlands, but in his heart, he is a Maori. From the age of 12, I was brought up with the Māori people being spoken to in the Māori language and um, learning the Māori culture. This piece here talks about one of the Māori gods, his name is Rongo. Rongo is a god of peace, but he is also uh, the god of growing vegetables, uh, also the god of listening. Scientifically, Ponamu is the toughest naturally occurring mineral in the known universe. And then we, of course we have such a beautiful green colour. So the Ponamu, when it was found here, brought about a new age of technology. It meant that tools could become more refined. The tools weren't as weighty, so you could work faster. It took so long to make those tools that they became precious and the broken tool was redeveloped and it became an ornament and as such it carried even more story that possibly this ornament came from the tool that carved my house, my boat, saved a life, took a life and then it was gifted to me and I'll gift it on and on and on and it'll remain precious for much longer than myself. But all of this starts at the river when I'm lucky enough to look down and there amongst normal stones is something that I know is special. <laughs> Jeremy can never stay away from searching for jade for too long. He leaves with a friend, Jimmy, another sculptor, driving on these mountain roads. Punamu comes from the mountains. The South Island was even called Tawai Punamu, the country of jade stones. The rivers that flow from Mount Cook and the Frank Joseph Glacier even share the stone's color. Jeremy begins his quest by his own personal ritual that aims at helping him blend with the elements. A flute like this was traditionally made out of the leg bone of an ancestor and when we breathe into it, put our spirit back to the spirit of our ancestor and use it as a way to communicate with the nature around us. When all of that comes together to make a sound, uh, we, we feel at peace and connected and it's a way of showing our appreciation to our ancestors and the gods before us. A long time ago it all came from the mountain, but when the glaciers moved through it carved out the whole deposit of Aotea and it's taken it into the river here and so we find it now anywhere along the sides of this river all the way down to the ocean. Uh, so this is the place I have to look. If I want to find Aotea, uh, it's right here. He 
has a sharp eye and he's already on the right track, but he's about to be surprised. I love this type of bonamu because when you cut it, it looks like looking up through the trees of the forest, seeing the light come through the leaves. This is a fantastic find. We're very lucky to find such a huge piece here um, today. This bonamu is property of Waitahu. It's their right to be able to claim any of, of this stone as their property uh, through the Ponamu Vesting Bill, which ensures that Ngaitahu have a form of uh, economic resource here. There's more weight than four people put together. Four people. We'll sell it to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take credit card. <laughs> Ponamu is precious and it's worth money. I, I could make money from that, but uh, I have plenty of stone and I have plenty of stone of very high quality. I'm very thankful for everything that I have and I don't need to keep getting more and more and more. I'm, I'm happy to have the river, so I'll leave the stones. Only the Maoris are allowed to take such big stones. Punamu is sacred, and for the last 20 years, the Maori have recovered their rights over this Tonga, the treasure of nature. At the mouth of the river, on the west coast, the little town of Hokitika is entirely dedicated to jade. This business guarantees the region's prosperity. This is Garth's occupation. He is one of the few authorized to remove jade found in the wilderness. In a way, the stone is in his veins, through his ancestors. They form a double kuru, which is family harmony and growth. And the nice thing about it is they've actually come from within inside the other person's hook. I like to do them like this because it has a lot more meaning than carving uh, uh, two different pieces out of different stone, so it, it's a, it has a nice connection. It's, it's a living thing. It's kept alive by people touching it, putting their mana into the stone. It's, it's part of us. It's an identity and it will never die. Ponamu is very important to us, um, the Māori of New Zealand. Um, we have a strong uh, history with it. This is what it was used for first. It was a taonga. It was a ceremonial tool, as a weapon and a, as a working tool. Highly treasured, um, and this is a picture of my great 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 granddad, Te Koti Tūranga, and he was the chief of the area. Being a descendant from Te Koiti allows me the, the rights to gather my own ponami myself. I only take what I can carve and work. I'm not allowed to take it to supply other carvers. We have been trading in the stone since we arrived here, pre-European. We actually lost control of the stone. The government came in when, and, and said, well, we own the, the mineral of, of this nephrite jade. And, and up until, well, I was just over 20 years ago, we, we have gained that right back. We don't cut it from the seam, we only take what naturally is, is given to us from the mountains and the rivers. So there's going to be stone for my children and their children and so on. The Maoris are recovering their lands, their culture 
and their language. Further south, on the shores of Wanaka Lake, Jeremy takes on a new role, that of a music teacher for the Maori language. So we just practice chanting that out ne? and lifting up that vibration of it. His class welcomes both Pakeas and Maoris, a beautiful example of what the New Zealand of tomorrow could be, a country reconciled and proud of its dual identity. Jeremy, of course, he's wonderful. He's an inspirator amongst us. He's not even Māori. For me, I'm a Māori, so I would always encourage it. I will always do it, and I will always perform it. I don't know, what do you think? Well, the culture in as a Pākehā, like, I mean, my, when I do my mihi, it only goes back, well, I go back five generations, you know, here in New Zealand, and I really don't know much about before that, and so this is the only country that I can really identify with, it's my identity, so it's an important part of um, my identity, you know, the first language and the first culture. But I think that we both can say that, yeah, <laughs> we're loving it. Yep. Yep. <laughs> So your foot lands on the mic. Here we go. Alright, one more time, there could have been a flute. I feel that New Zealand's undergoing a renaissance. Māori language and culture are undergoing a renaissance. In the 1980s, that wasn't the case. There was a lot of shame associated to being Māori, being poor. So now that's changed, uh, we're proud of being Māori. So my job is to teach everybody the language, not just Māori. My grandfather would say, when I speak Māori to my Māoris, it's good for Māori. When you speak Māori to your people, it's good for the whole world. The Māori language has long been abandoned, almost lost, but it is now reborn, and with it, young people are now proud once more of their origins. To truly measure the sweep of the trend, it's best to leave behind these vertiginous natural landscapes and head to Auckland, where most of the Maoris now live. The country's economic centre is home to 1.5 million people. That's one third of the country's population. Their voice echoes in this urbanised environment. Festivals about Maori and Polynesian culture have become a key event. And the symbol of this renaissance is called Polyfest. 65 schools and around 20,000 students face off in a competition of traditional dances and haka. The contest was created at the end of the 1970s. It lasts for three days and has grown from a relatively discreet event to the highlight of the year. In Auckland's southern suburb, this school has been preparing itself for the last couple of weeks. Good morning. We're going to have a good day. We're going to um, perform very hard and we're going to represent our school. We're going into the zone. As soon as we leave the bus, you go there, all the other kura are going to be in the zone and they're, done, they're not even going to want to know you. All right, so we have to flick the switch now and we need to flick into Papa Kura Haka's mode. That's why I just went on the bus and he was just wishing, wishing them all the best and thanking them for representing our kura, representing their culture. Marama! Papa Kura School intends to defend its colours and restore the image of these disadvantaged neighbourhoods. Actually, 
Today we are we're getting ready for our performance, which is at 2:40. Um, over there we have the hair station where all the girls do their hair or their makeup and all that. Uh, when our tutors get here, up there we'll have the boys getting ready, getting all painted up on our legs, getting our muko. And it's a very important day because for us this is war. Nah, never afraid. If you be afraid, that means you're not a winner. So if you want to win, go to go in with a positive attitude. People think about Pop Guru Hai. Um, like, what they think about us is all about the fighting. We want to change that and um, let people know that we've changed. We've gone into the positive side. We're not that bad. We're not that bad stuff no more. We are positive, good school. No. Um, we're just making G-strings for the boys. So we're just, I'm just cutting out. Yeah. The school had been ranked seventh last year, and they hope to improve their performance so nothing's left to chance. Costume, makeup, choreography, the quality of the singing, everything will be graded. Watch that, ah, uh, that note, I think that's a, it's a half and it's dangerous if you go flat. Yeah. I just need to take a bigger breath. And then they come, they come in. Yeah, they come. Yeah, nice. That was good, Oi. That was good. That was good. I like that. I just want to make sure that all our soloists are okay because I haven't really had time to touch bass and all good. Today we're going to see that come to come to life. That's real important to show, to show, to show your culture because um, it's who we are. Um, if you don't know who you are, then you know you're lost. The final part of the show will be the haka. Ha means to breathe. Ka means to ignite. Haka literally means to ignite the fire we breathe. And here again, the devil is in the detail. <laughs> You gotta hold it there for five seconds, okay? You're in post. You're not doing anything with your face, bro. Everyone else is going facials, G, and there you're the only one standing there. But, and facials again. Perform. Do it the whole time. Why katota makiro? He. Every huck is good. Depends on how you perform it. So you can make the easiest hucker look like the best one. Um, in front of a big crowd today, so for our wahine here is that she just has an awesome experience. Whether we win or not, you know, it's not the most important thing. Our whole community backs them. But I know they can win. Because <laughs> they're awesome. <laughs> So this is a muku kauai, which is a traditional um, tattoo. Uh, it's got four koru in it. Uh, koru is what we believe is the uh, the inspiration of life. And now, in the last three or four years, uh, the kauai, the muku kauai, has really come back. And um, there's been a new a generation of women that have had their kauai done and they're quite young too so it's a real high status thing and um, we as Māori we really love to showcase it.
come closer. When you were given to this to wear, it was a tohu or a sign that you had cert learnt certain mov movements, you had speed, you had agility, and if you had one of these, then people knew that you um, deserved to wear it. You go on your feet for the rest of the day until after you get off stage. <laughs> I feel like I'm a warrior with, with the group. When you put this on, it's a privilege. It's like you're, you're going to war. Like you're telling a whole new story for yourself. That's what I get. Maratai ko fakamaru e titi rai penga he ma nga manu ko no tiro ko e hoi owe. Oh o te o ni a tiai. That's it. Everyone's ready. The students will go through one last full rehearsal, just like the professionals. All the way to the bus, just like a rugby coach, the song and dance teacher is motivating her troops. Who we are? You're representing that iwi, because that is where your school is situated. You have a little Māori warrior, a little Māori person inside of you. Let him out. Let her or him out. This is where the battle will take place, on this campus. This year, 70 schools and 252 groups are facing off. Some even came from the Samoa, the Tonga, the Fiji, and from Tahiti. The Polyfest is very popular. Almost 100,000 people watch the competition. This is the biggest gathering featuring Polynesian culture in the world. We already won. Uh, see some transformations with her now. Aotearoa, from where they were, from Hoha kids to now disciplined. Um, they set goals for themselves and are now starting to understand the true essence of uh, humility, attitude, sacrifice and all of that. That's uh, awesome. Let's go, come on. Wait, 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 stop. A 10-minute choreography. Everything hangs in the balance. Stage. I hope they're happy with themselves. 
Hopefully they smash it. I'm really happy with what they've done today. Just like those gathered today, a whole people is slowly winning back and regaining its colors in New Zealand. Indeed, the Maori are busy reclaiming their culture. <laughs> 